Chapter 1. 1893, Montana. Charlotte Miller, known as Charlie to friends and family, was having a hard time. She lived with her closest friend in the world, Mary Bellman, and Charlie served as a helper for her with her children. In the two years since she and Mary had moved to Montana with Mary's niece and nephew, Mary had a child and was expecting her second. Charlie loved Mary with everything inside her, and she was thrilled to be able to help her and her family, but she was ready to have a family of her own as well. She was 22 now, and she felt that she should have been married long ago. She thought about writing a letter to her sister, Elizabeth, back in Beckham, Massachusetts, but Elizabeth usually matched women of the East with men of the West. It would be strange for a woman with 50 single men right there in her town to have to resort to being a mail-order bride. But she was worried that's exactly what would happen. The children were down for a nap, all except Addie, who was quietly playing with her dolls in the parlor. Charlie went up the stairs to talk to Mary, who was in her workshop, her favorite place to spend the afternoons. Mary had a business carving and selling Christmas ornaments, and even though Christmas had just passed, she was working on her inventory for next Christmas. It was strange to Charlie that someone who despised Christmas the way Mary did made their living by making Christmas ornaments. When she walked into the workshop, Mary looked up. Is everything all right? Charlie nodded. I'm just feeling restless. I'm going to go walk in the snow. Mary nodded. Stay close to home. Clyde thinks there's a big storm coming. Clyde always thinks there's a big storm coming. He's always right, too. Charlie sighed. I know he is. I'll stay close. She wanted to just start walking and see where she ended up, but Mary was right. It just wasn't safe. Not at this time of year when a storm could blow out of nowhere at any minute. January in Montana was not known for mild weather. Charlie closed Mary's door and went downstairs, getting her mittens, coat, scarf, and hat on, and she left the house. She knew she should stay inside and not brave the weather, but the cabin fever was growing strong. Her first two winters in Montana had been fine, and she'd done everything she could to help Mary. She still helped Mary, but this year was different. She needed to be out doing something, anything, that didn't include being inside the house all the time. As she walked, Charlie's eyes stayed on the horizon, partially because she was worried about a storm coming, but more because she wanted to go there and beyond. Somewhere out there something was waiting for her, waiting to change her life, and she was ready for it to happen. As she walked, she saw the storm rolling toward them. She stopped for a moment, trying to judge how far away it was. She decided she could walk a little farther, and she kept going toward the road that led into town. A man in a wagon stopped near her, and she backed up a couple of steps. It was too isolated to not be as careful as she should. Can I help you? The wind was blowing hard, and she had to shield her eyes from its harshness. What she could see of the man made her feel more than she had felt for all of the cowboys in mistletoe combined. Do you live near here? I'm trying to find Mrs. Mary Bellman. His voice was deep and sent a shiver through her that had absolutely nothing to do with the chill in the air. Mary is my friend. That's her house right over there. As she pointed at the house, she realized that the snow was blowing enough that you couldn't see it from where she stood. Come with me. I'll show you. She wanted to spend more time with this man. She'd never had that desire before, and she'd had more than ten marriage proposals in the two years she'd been in mistletoe. But she wasn't willing to settle for just any cowboy. The man she married needed to be the man to light a spark within her. Like Clyde did to Mary. She turned and walked toward the house, walking against the wind. It was blowing so hard, she felt as if she was going to fall over. She hoped Clyde had made it back to Mary because she knew her friend would be worried until he arrived. Do you think it's a problem for me to put my horses in the barn? He asked. I don't want to leave them out in this. I'm sure it's not, she yelled above the wind that had quickly risen in volume since she'd started her walk. 
Hurry! She went inside and removed her winter wear, pulling a shawl over her shoulders and going into the parlor to add another log to the fire. Quickly running upstairs, she told Mary there was a stranger there to meet her, and then she rushed back down. Little Addie was still playing in the parlor, and she looked at Charlie oddly. Is something wrong with you, Charlie? There's a bad storm coming in. I'm afraid your Uncle Clyde is going to get stuck out in it. Oh. Addie frowned. Carol and I don't want him to get snowed on. Carol was Addie's favorite doll. Charlie could see that baby big nose and baby ugly hair were playing with them as well. Well, it's too late for that. He will get snowed on, but we really don't want him to get stuck out in the storm. Charlie looked toward the front door again. There's a stranger here looking for your Aunt Mary. I don't know who he is, but we're all about to find out. All right? Addie nodded. I like to meet new people sometimes. I know you do. So do I. Charlie kept watching the door, waiting for the man to knock or just walk in. She didn't know which he'd do. Finally, there was a knock on the door, and Charlie ran over to open it. It was much too cold to discuss anything outside, so she threw the door open. Come in. I let Mary know you were here to see her. The man stomped the snow off his feet and pants as best he could before he stepped into the house. Charlie felt Addie walk over beside her, clinging to her leg. I'm Charlie, and this is Mary's niece, Addie. Do you live with Mary? he asked, seeming surprised. Yes, I came west with her two years ago, to help out with her niece and nephew. I've stayed on since. Charlie didn't add that she'd come hoping to find a man to marry, because that was none of the stranger's business. And you stayed here all that time? Well, she's had another baby since, and she's expecting again. She needs the help if she's going to keep up her work. Ah. Her work. Exactly what I was thinking to talk to her about. Does she have a workshop for her carvings? Charlotte shook her head. No, sir. She has a room upstairs she uses as a workroom, and she stores the ornaments there. Mary came down the stairs then, her eyes on the stranger. I'm Mary Bellman. How can I help you today? The man's face lit up. Mrs. Bellman, I'm Abel Burton. I'm a merchant, and I have a small store in Missoula, but it's just for artists, like yourself. I sell hand-carved ornaments and statues and many different paintings. I was wondering if I could make some sort of deal with you to carry your works. Mary smiled. That depends. Are you looking for ornaments or more like the little animals I carve? I'm not looking for more ornaments, the man said. I'm hoping you'd be willing to concentrate some of your creative energy on some of the animals that I've seen floating around that you carved. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a grizzly bear standing on its back legs, its paws held up on either side of its head. Something like this one. Mary smiled as she looked at the small animal figure in his hand. That's definitely one of mine. I remember making it. Where did you get it? A friend bought it from the mercantile here in Mistletoe and brought it to me as a gift. I've meant to ride out here to find you many times, but I'm busy. So I closed the store for a few days and came to find the artist who makes these beauties. I don't suppose you have any in stock? I have a few. I usually just keep my ornaments stocked, but the larger carvings are where my heart is, and I find myself doing them when I probably shouldn't. I'd love to see anything you have on hand. I could sell several of this size every day. Oh, my. That would be lovely. I don't enjoy making the ornaments nearly as much, and I would love to be able to concentrate all my time on the animals. Mary frowned. I wish my husband were here and we could sit and talk business. Charlie glanced out the window at the blowing storm. She just hoped Clyde managed to make it in out of the blizzard. Looking closer, she saw a flash of blue. He's out there. Charlie opened the door and yelled. Clyde. 
A moment later, Clyde was inside with her. Glad you yelled at me, Charlie. I was a little worried I wouldn't be able to find my way inside. He looked around and spotted the other man there in his dining room. Hello, I'm Clyde Bellman. I'm Abel Burton. I'm here to talk to your wife about her beautiful wood carvings. Abel held out his hand for the other man to shake. Clyde smiled. My wife is an amazing artist, isn't she? She is. I have a feeling you're going to be staying a little longer than what you had planned. The storm is worse than I was thinking it would be. Clyde glanced out the window, shuddering at the cold. As he talked, he pulled off his heavy coat, gloves, and boots. I think we should sit down and discuss this. Abel nodded. I would love to. Charlie smiled at them. I'll put some coffee on. You'll all feel more like talking business when you're not quite so cold. She glanced at Clyde. Do you need food as well? I started a huge pot of stew this morning, and I'm sure it's ready to be tasted. Clyde nodded. Thank you, Charlie. That would be wonderful. Mary? Mr. Burton? Mary shook her head. Not at the moment. I'll wait until supper. Abel nodded. Some stew sounds wonderful. I haven't eaten since breakfast. Charlie hurried off to get coffee for everyone and two bowls of stew. She wasn't sure if she should join them at the table or go elsewhere. She wanted to spend more time with Mr. Burton and get to know him, but she wasn't sure if that would even be appropriate. The others were going to be talking about business. She carried the bowls of stew in and then poured four cups of coffee, carrying two at a time into the dining room. She set hers on the side, not in use, and sat down with it. She was interested in what was said, and there was no reason for her not to be part of it. Mary had a shocked look on her face. So you want me to commit to making an animal per day for your store? Well, twenty per month, but that's a lot. And I'll be taking time off soon. She put her hand on her belly, showing off the baby that was due in a couple of months. Why don't you make whatever you can for me, but starting in September, you commit to the 20 per month. I think you'd have to stop making the Christmas ornaments, though. I would actually like to stop making the Christmas ornaments. I prefer the animals. Mary looked at Clyde. What do you think? This would be steady income in a way what I do currently isn't but I would have to stop doing my catalog sales altogether. I never dreamed I'd be able to stop that. Charlie could see the excitement on her face. She knew Mary hated Christmas, and the ornaments made her feel like a hypocrite. Clyde shook his head. We don't need your income, Mary. We never have. You can keep working like you have been, start selling only to Mr. Burton, or quit outright. It really doesn't matter. Mary made a face. I like to think it does matter. I'm sorry. What you do makes a lot of people happy, and you bring in extra money for things I wouldn't be able to buy otherwise. I don't mean that what you do is unimportant. Charlie hid a smile. She had heard this discussion more times than she could count. Mary had twice been in a situation where she needed to rely on others for help and she never wanted to be there again. If anything happened to Clyde, Mary could support herself and the children with her business. Mary bit her lip. I'll do it, Mr. Burton. Do you have a contract? Or are we just doing a handshake deal? Just a handshake deal for now. I'll have a contract sent to you. He took his first bite of stew and smiled. This is delicious. Thank you, Charlie said softly. She couldn't believe her attraction to this man. With all of the single men in mistletoe, not one of them had struck her as this man did. It was ridiculous. Mary looked over at Abel. I think you're going to have to spend the night. I hope you don't mind bedding down on the sofa in the parlor. It's the best we can offer you. Will your wife be worried, Mr. Burton? Abel shook his head. I'm not married, ma'am. 
I see. Mary's eyes met Charlie's, and Charlie kicked her softly under the table, letting her friend know to back off. I plan to serve supper at six, Charlie said, glancing at the clock on the wall that said it was half past two. I'll have fresh bread to go with it. That sounds delicious. I don't often get the opportunity for a home-cooked meal. That's the hard part of moving out west. There just aren't as many women as there are men in these parts. Abel looked over at Charlie, letting her know silently that he was thinking about her in those ways. Clyde nodded. I ended up sending back east for my Mary. She was a mail-order bride. She brought Charlie with her to help with the kids during travel, and Charlie just sort of stayed on with us. I don't know what we'd do without her now. Abel looked over at Charlie. I'm surprised no cowboy has tried to ride off into the sunset with you. Charlie laughed. Oh, a few have tried. There were tussles over me when we first arrived, but none of the men in town really drew me. Not like you do. Well, that's too bad. I'm sure you'll find the right man soon enough. Abel yawned. Riding out today was downright stupid, but I have more people visiting the store in the summer, so I thought I'd be fine. I guess not. He shook his head. I should have been thinking about the weather and not just my bottom line. Clyde shook his head. You're not going to get back to Missoula for some time, I think. I have a feeling you're right. Are you sure you don't mind me sleeping on your sofa? I can't imagine kicking you out in a storm like we're having. Stay until the storm passes, and by then we'll have a better idea of who we're doing business with. Clyde stood up and stretched, before sitting down again. I hate when the weather forces me inside, but I sure do like the extra time to play with the children. Addie walked over then, handed Clyde a doll, and climbed on his lap. Uncle Clyde, I think Carol is getting lonely and needs a nice new friend. What about baby big nose and baby ugly hair? They're her friends? Addie tilted her head to one side. She was a beautiful little girl with bright red hair. Well, because they are so ugly, they aren't really her equals. She needs a doll who can be a true equal, don't you think? Clyde sighed. I didn't think the dolls were ugly when I bought them for you. Then you might need to wear spectacles, Uncle Clyde. Addie climbed back down, her doll tucked under her arm as she walked back to the parlor. There was a shout from upstairs, and Charlie jumped to her feet. I'll go get Joey. You need to stop running up and down the stairs all the time. She worried about Mary and her constant need to be active as she hurried up the stairs and picked up Joey, hugging him close. We have a visitor today, so you have to be on your best behavior. Joey nodded, his big brown eyes huge in his face. I'd be good. Let's go. Charlie set Joey on the floor and let him run toward the stairs on his own. He was up and down them constantly, he just hadn't figured how to get out of his room yet. Then she went over to check on little Isabel. The baby was awake and standing in her crib, sucking on her thumb. She efficiently changed the child's diaper and carried her down the stairs with her. Holding a baby felt like a kind of a shield when it came to men. As soon as they were downstairs, Mary held her arms out for Isabel. There's my baby. Charlie saw that Joey had already climbed onto his Uncle Clyde's lap. Joey loved Clyde more than anyone. Now you've met the whole household, Mary said to Abel. We're not outnumbered by children yet, but give us another couple of months. Abel laughed. Well, I think you're all doing a good job making it work for you. His eyes drifted over to Charlie, who was sitting with no child on her lap, but she was carefully helping Addie with her baby's dress. Then and there, Abel decided he was going to take Charlie home with him as his wife. He wasn't sure if she would be agreeable, but he'd find some way to convince her. Chapter 2 Charlie baked bread for supper, wishing she'd taken more time with her appearance that day. She was wearing an old work dress, and her hair was pinned atop her head. She wouldn't be surprised if she had flour on her face. 
She wasn't used to seeing anyone but Mary and her immediate family during the middle of the week. Clyde even kept the men who worked on the ranch away from the house, afraid they'd disrupt his well-run home. After taking the two loaves out of the oven, she set the table, well aware that Clyde, Mary, and Abel had taken their discussions into the parlor, where they would be more comfortable. The three children played on the floor at their feet. When everything was ready on the table and the cobbler she'd made for dessert was in the oven, they all gathered in the dining room to eat. Charlie had added a chair at the table for Abel, and she'd made sure to put it beside her chair. Oh how she wanted to capture the attention of the merchant there at the table. Why he had struck her in a way no other man in town had, she didn't know, but she wasn't about to argue with herself. Clyde said a brief blessing over the meal, and Charlie carefully cut the bread into slices. She hoped that Abel loved her cooking enough to propose on the spot. When she let out a little giggle at the idea, everyone looked at her, and she blushed. Sorry. Lost in thought. I like your laugh, Abel said softly. She smiled at him, her mind going to what sort of trick she could play on him to get him to stay longer. Obviously, he'd have to stay through the storm, but she could sneak out during the night and paint the windows white, that would make everyone think the snow was over the house. She shook her head at her silliness and took a sip of her milk. While they ate, Addie told them about everything she'd done with her dolls that day, as if they hadn't all been with her. Joey said he'd had fun driving his trains. Every year for Christmas, Joey got more cars to add to his train and Addie got more toys to go with her dolls. She adored her playmates, and they tried to keep them with things to do during the long winters there in Montana. How long do you think the storm will last? Charlie asked Clyde. Clyde always had a sixth sense about the storms that plagued the area. I'm thinking three days this time. I probably won't be able to get out and help the bison until Saturday or so. Clyde was a bison rancher, believing that the only native cattle to the continent would have a better chance to provide the meat needed. Three days? Abel asked, shaking his head. Do you really think we'll be stuck for that long? You're welcome to stay with us as long as you need to. The sofa in the parlor isn't particularly good for sleeping on, but it's yours as long as you need it. Clyde sighed. I hate these storms so much. They keep me from doing my work, and I always get a little cabin fever. I'd rather be outside working in the cold than in here, wishing I could be out. I have a little paperwork I can always do, but I spend most of my time staring out the window praying for spring. I appreciate your hospitality. I'm not sure what I'd do otherwise. Abel looked over at Charlie. And you've provided a beautiful woman for me to gaze at while I'm here. Charlie smiled. She'll even converse with you, if you'd like. Mary looked at Charlie with a startled expression. Charlie understood immediately. She'd never really been interested in any of the men in the area and Mary would have a hard time if she left. We'll all talk. Abel shook his head. You need to keep working if you can. With being stuck in the house, I would think you'd like to fill your time up with something productive, since the rest of us can't. He hadn't planned to leave his store closed for more than a week, but he could see it was going to be a necessity. He wished he'd listened to the butcher, who had a shop next door to his. He had been talking about this storm for a week. He said he could always tell, because his meat bothered him before a storm. When they'd all finished eating, Charlie got to her feet. I have an apple cobbler in the oven. Let me get it out, and we can eat it hot. Abel patted his stomach. I haven't had anyone feed me a good dessert in a very long time. Clyde smiled. We love our dessert around here and Charlie is a magnificent cook. Mary's cooking is wonderful as well, but she doesn't have as much time to bake. That's why we're so thankful for Charlie. Charlie made a mental note to herself to send a letter to her sister, Elizabeth, right away. One of her younger sisters who was no longer part of the demon horde could easily take her place and help Mary with the kids, the house, and her new baby. 
Charlie dished up a small plate of cobbler for everyone, making certain to set Joey's far from him on the table while it cooled. He was not known for waiting for anything when there were sweets involved. She poured all of the adults another cup of coffee to go with the dessert and sat down again, beside Abel. I hope you like my cobbler. I dried a bunch of apples in the fall, so I could use them for things like this. Abel took a bite of the cobbler and closed his eyes to allow the flavors to explode on his tongue. Your use of cinnamon is wonderful. Not too much, but enough. He took one more bite, nodding with pleasure. Delicious. Charlie smiled. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Love is a better word. I'm about to ask this cobbler to marry me. Addie giggled. You can't marry cobbler. You have to marry a girl. I'm too young, though. Don't look at me. Laughter from the whole table followed that statement. Even from little Isabel, who obviously had no idea what was funny, but she laughed anyway. She didn't want to be left out. Abel looked over at Addie with a smile. I promise I will not ask you to marry me. I won't even ask the cobbler, but I want to. You should ask Aunt Charlie. She's not married, and she's a girl. She might be too old to marry, though. I'm not sure. Addie continued eating calmly, unaware that her words had Charlie blushing and Abel, grinning at the woman in question. Well, I might do that. She doesn't look too old to me. Do you still have all your teeth, Charlie? I do. Charlie said, determined to go along with the game, no matter how embarrassed she was. And I have yet to find a gray hair. I'm aging gracefully. Abel shook his head. I'm glad to hear it. I will have to talk to Addie a little more about what I should look for in a wife. Addie shrugged. You don't want one who yells. She needs to be able to cook. And she can't be so ugly that you can't kiss her with your eyes open. I see. I'm so glad you've explained all that to me. I'll watch Charlie and make sure she fits what I'm looking for. It would help me a lot if you pointed out her good qualities while I'm here. She has lots of them, so be ready. Addie ate the last bite of her cobbler and pushed it away. She makes the best cobbler of anyone in the whole wide world. She looked at the man across from her. Aren't you going to write this down? Addie didn't understand why everyone at the table laughed at that, but Abel did his best to treat what she said seriously. I'll remember it and write it down just as soon as I get to my pencil and paper. Good. You don't want to forget any of her good qualities. That would be a crying shame. It would. Abel winked at Charlie. No crying shames around here. I'm going to be mindful of all your good qualities. Charlie shook her head. You'll run out soon enough. She got up to clear the table, aware that Mary was right behind her, helping her. When they got to the kitchen, Charlie looked at her friend. That was the most embarrassing meal I have ever sat through. Mary chuckled. I think you have feelings for him already. Charlie, don't let us hold you back. We can make it without you. Charlie blushed, but nodded. I am going to ask Elizabeth to send one of my sisters to help you. Don't worry. I'll make sure she's not in the demon horde. That is a worry, Mary said, referring to the name her younger siblings had been called by since she was a girl. A former demon horde member is exactly what I need, though. Look how working with you turned out. Charlie smiled as she went back for more dishes. I don't know how we went to the same school all our lives and were never friends. I've never had a better friend than you, Mary. I know why. I was afraid of the entire demon horde, especially their idea girl. My friend Charlie doesn't seem to have anything in common with the demon horde, though. Together, the women cleared the table and did the dishes. Then they went through their usual bedtime routine with the children. Finally, all of the children were tucked into bed, and the two of them joined the men in the parlor. They were talking about finances and money, 
but the discussion changed when the girls joined them. Mary sat on the sofa with Clyde, leaning against him, her belly almost hidden in the folds of her dress. Charlie sat in one of the chairs in the parlor, facing Abel. The children are in bed, and the dishes are done. Abel smiled. You made short work of those things. Are you always so efficient? Yes, I really am. I love to read, you see, and I get through my work as quickly as I can, so I will have some time to read. Really? I didn't immediately see you as a reader. What is your favorite book? I love Little Women. I like all of Charles Dickens' work. I'm a particular fan of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, I could never choose a real favorite, because I love them all. Charlie's entire face became animated as she talked about the book she loved. Abel smiled. What is your favorite thing about reading? I love that I can open a book and be transported to a faraway place and learn new things about different cultures. When my real life seems too mundane, I disappear into a book and feel my whole world change around me. Well, that sounds like a good reason to read to me. He enjoyed reading himself, and he'd never heard anyone explain why quite so clearly. Are you a reader, Abel? Charlie felt daring using his given name, but everyone else was, so why wouldn't she? I am. I love to lose myself in a book. I'm a particular fan of Jules Verne. I like the way he creates a world that makes no sense to us, but plays out perfectly within his pages. Her face lit up at the idea of him being a book lover. He seemed more and more perfect for her by the minute. That's wonderful. I haven't read his works yet, but I've been told they're very good. I really want to read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That's my favorite of his books, though I love them all. Mary looked at Clyde with a huge grin on her face. Charlie knew exactly what she was thinking, and she just hoped her friend didn't try to interfere. Mary yawned dramatically. The baby has been weighing heavily on me all day. I think I need to call it a night. Clyde frowned at his wife. Do you need me? I could really use the help up the stairs. Clyde got to his feet and carefully helped his wife off the sofa. We'll bid you good night, then. Mary smiled at Charlie. Good night, my friend. Good night, Mary. After she knew the other couple was out of earshot, Charlie moved to the sofa. I'll be able to hear you better from here. He moved to sit beside her. And now, even though the wind is howling, neither of us will have to raise our voices to hear one another. He reached out and tucked a stray tendril of her dark hair out of her face. There. Now you can hear me better. She smiled. I'm so glad you weren't outside when the storm hit. So am I. Thank you for being the dashing heroine who saved the day in the little story of my life. Charlie shook her head, laughing softly. Heroine is a word that has never been used to describe me. Though I've heard miscreant more than a dozen times. She decided that she needed to tell him about the girl she used to be, so he could make an informed decision about her. I grew up with fourteen brothers and sisters. I was actually one of the older siblings, and the oldest, to receive the name Demon Horde. My younger siblings and I were truly creative in the ways we tormented everyone we came across and really our entire community. He grinned. I have a brother, and we were well known for getting up to hijinks as well. Really? Charlie found him so much easier to talk to as soon as he admitted to that. We never had a teacher for more than a semester because of the reptiles we hid in her desk. And the shoes we tied together so she'd trip. And maybe it was the tipping over of the outhouse that happened at least once per semester. He laughed. We did all those things at different times. Cain and I were real monsters. Wait, your parents named you Cain and Abel? What were they thinking? Well, they spelled his name with a K. My father was a college professor, and he thought the stories in the Bible were myths, so he, he looked at things differently. He was actually pleased with the trouble my brother and I got up to, 
because he thought it showed that we knew how to think outside the box. Your father sounds like he was awfully special. He was. He was killed when I was twenty, so I took my inheritance and came west, determined to bring a little culture to this area. That's why I opened my shop. It started as an art gallery, but I find I like it more as just a store where people can buy the works of local artists. Did you ever think about going into writing? she asked. I've thought about it dozens of times because of my love for reading, but then I wasn't sure if I could ever get good enough, so I gave up that idea. I thought about it briefly. I find I'm more of an entrepreneur than a writer. He stroked her cheek with the back of one finger. Ever since I first saw you today, I've been thinking about kissing you. Would you mind? She smiled. She'd never been kissed, but she'd read him right. He wanted to kiss her, and she wanted that kiss, more than she could express. Yes, please. He smiled at her response. Women usually nodded demurely in answer to that question, trying to act like they were modest. Charlie's enthusiastic response made him happy. He cupped her face in his hands and lowered his head to hers, kissing her softly. When her lips immediately responded, and her mouth opened a bit, he deepened the kiss, wrapping his arms around her and pulling her closer. Charlie loved the feel of his lips on hers. It ignited a spark deep inside her in a place she'd never even been aware of. Moving even closer to him, she found herself on his lap, kissing him with everything inside her. Abel let out a groan and lifted his head. You are some woman, Charlie. You can call me Charlotte if you prefer. He shook his head adamantly. No, I like Charlie. It suits you nicely. No one ever expects a Charlie to wear a skirt. She chuckled. I've found that to be very true in my years as a Charlie. My older sister, Susan, called me Charlie from the day I was born, and everyone else took the nickname on as well. She blushed, realizing she was still on his lap, and she moved to sit beside him instead. Abel sighed. I liked it better when you were on my lap, but I suppose I'm going to have to get used to you sitting beside me. Charlie smiled. I hope it's something you're around long enough to have to get used to. He laughed. Well, I'm taking you with me when I leave. Whether you know it yet or not, Charlie Miller, you're going to be my wife. The only question is whether you'll be a virgin bride or not. I would like to be, she said softly. Then I suggest you go to bed right now. I have lots of ideas for what I could do with you floating through my head. I'm not ready to stop here. Charlie grinned, getting up, hurrying toward the stairs, and heading to her room and her bed. As she fell asleep, she dreamed about ways he could touch her. She knew those were things she shouldn't even be thinking about, but how could she stop her mind? Chapter 3 Charlie took extra care with her appearance the next morning. She wanted to look like a Charlotte, for a change, and not a Charlie. When she was dressed in her Sunday best and her hair was as perfect as she could make it, she went into Addie's room to check on the girl, as she did every morning. Addie was sitting on her bed, playing with Carol and Baby Big Nose. Are you ready to help me make breakfast? Addie nodded. I want to pour the milk today. Sounds good to me. Charlie knew she meant she wanted to pour the milk for herself and her brother and sister. Charlie would do everything else. And she was going to make pancakes, because she made very good pancakes. And bacon. Who didn't love some crisp bacon with their breakfast? When they got downstairs, everything was quiet, so Charlie built up the fire in the stove and mixed up the pancake batter. They would use the maple syrup she'd made from tapping the maple trees the previous spring. They still had enough for a few more meals, and she wanted to show off all she knew how to do for Abel. Just thinking his name made her sigh. She wanted him to take her home as his wife, just like he'd said the night before, but she couldn't leave Mary without help. Not when she was so close to her time. Perhaps there was a young woman in town who could help until one of her younger sisters arrived. 
As she thought about the problem, she mixed the pancake batter and fried up the bacon while Addie set the table and poured milk into three glasses. What a great job you did, Addie. Thank you. I think I should put the butter on the table. Don't you? I think you could do that easily. Charlie said, refusing to think more about Abel until breakfast was on the table. Addie considered this time where the two of them cooked every morning special, and Charlie wasn't going to detract from it. So what do you think I should make for supper? Charlie asked Addie. Oh, I want chicken and dumplings. It's cold, and they warm you up all through you, and we could have bread with it. And you should make your apple cake. You make the best apple cake in all of the world. Charlie laughed. Mary had taught her to make chicken and dumplings shortly after they'd arrived in Montana, and she agreed with Addie that it was the best thing to eat while you were cold during a storm. I'll do that, then. Once breakfast was finished, Charlie sent Addie upstairs to wake her aunt and uncle, who didn't usually sleep as late as 6.30, but with the storm, schedules were thrown out the window. Charlie headed into the parlor to wake Abel, standing for a moment watching him sleep, his legs curled up so he would fit on the sofa. She walked to his side and placed her hand on his shoulder. Abel. It's breakfast time. He woke with a start, sitting up on the sofa, gripping her waist as he pulled her down onto his lap and kissing her passionately. I never dreamed an angel would wake me this morning. Charlie giggled, squirming away from him, even though she wanted to sit there with him forever. I don't want anyone to see us, and everyone will be downstairs in a minute or two. I'm telling them this morning. When she started to ask what he was telling, the others arrived downstairs, and they all gathered around the table, filling their plates. Abel said the prayer for them, and after everyone had chorused amen, he began fixing his pancakes the way he liked them. I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm not leaving here empty-handed. I plan on taking Charlie away with me as my wife. Mary smiled. I'm so glad. It seemed to be going in that direction, but I couldn't be sure. Clyde sighed. When Charlie first arrived, I didn't want her here. I actually resented her, because I felt like she was taking Mary's time away from me. Now that I know Charlie so much better and I'm aware of everything she does to help us out, I'm thrilled that she's here. We're really going to miss you in this house, Charlie. Charlie smiled. I'll miss you as well. I'm planning to write to my sister, Elizabeth, hoping that she will send one of our non-demon horde younger sisters. And I think I can help you find someone in town to take my place until my sister arrives. Annabelle Borchard isn't planning to marry for another few months, and I know she and her fiancé are trying to save money until then. Mary nodded, looking relieved. I think Annabelle will be perfect in the meantime. She can practice her housekeeping skills as she earns money. And I doubt it will take Elizabeth long to send one of your sisters. There are certainly enough to choose from. Make sure to tell her I want someone who will be a good influence on the children, just as you have been, Clyde said. Charlie felt tears well up in her eyes. She knew that when they'd first arrived in Montana, Clyde hadn't approved of her as a role model for the children, and now he was asking for someone like her. It was an abrupt change, but one that she felt complimented by. Well, we do need to marry before we can leave. I hope the storm is almost over. Charlie wanted to marry immediately. She didn't want to have to spend another night alone. Abel must have understood what she was saying, because he reached over and gripped her hand in his. I'm glad there's a plan in place, so you won't be left high and dry, he said, nodding politely to Mary. Oh, I wouldn't be able to leave without a plan in place. I've learned so much about being a housewife and a mother from Mary, but it's not only that. Mary is my dearest friend in the entire world. I couldn't leave her with everything she needs to do. That's not a worry, though, Clyde said. Because there's a plan in place. When we all go into town so the two of you can marry, we will make sure to talk to Annabelle and her parents. She's 18 and more than responsible enough to take your place here, Charlie. 
Charlie was thrilled her plan was going over so well with the Bellmans. She had worried a little about leaving them, but now she didn't need to anymore. Abby told me she wants to have chicken and dumplings for supper along with bread and some apple cake. Does that work for you, Mary? she asked. They always made their plans for supper while they ate their breakfast. That way Mary could disappear and do her carving as soon as she wanted to. Mary nodded. I'm going to take advantage of the storm and work all day, so I can send Abel home with some carvings. Clyde can help with the children, and you'll be on kitchen duty all day. Charlie nodded. She was always on kitchen duty, but usually she and Mary shared the responsibility of the children until after lunchtime. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm happy to do whatever I need to do. She thought longingly about having a beautiful dress to wear for the wedding, but she knew that wasn't going to happen. There was no time. As soon as breakfast was over, Mary went upstairs while Charlie cleared the table and started the dishes. She was surprised to see Abel pick up a towel and stand beside her. You're going to dry the dishes? she asked. He nodded. You're obviously doing extra today, so I'm going to do the same. It won't kill me to dry them. She grinned. Who does your dishes at home? There's a little diner down the street from my store. I eat most of my meals there. I hire a girl to come in once a week and clean and do my laundry, but for the most part, I do things myself. I would never have pictured you as a man capable of dealing with domestic chores. I can't say that I'm disappointed. He chuckled. I'm not only capable, I'm willing. Are you willing to work in the store on occasion? Of course. I'm happiest when I'm busy. Or reading, he added with a grin. I do all my work as quickly as I can, so I can read sooner. I hope you're all right with that, because it's the only way I know how to be. Definitely. He looked behind them and kissed the tip of her nose. I want you to read as often as possible. But your responsibilities will be a little different when we get to my home. Unless you have three children, they will be very different. He grinned. No kids for me. My brother's wife may ask you to help out on occasion, but I doubt it. Does your brother live near you? He nodded. Yeah, he owns a ranch on the outskirts of town, and his wife is a little, we'll call her spoiled and leave it at that. She thinks she married a man who is required to provide everything for her, so if there are times you don't want to help out, you don't need to. Do they have children? She's expecting now. I'm sure she's going to think you need to clean her house and cook their meals because you're not expecting, but trust me, it's all up to you. You have no responsibility to take care of them. I'll keep that in mind. Charlie wasn't sure what she thought of Kane's wife after Abel's. Description, but she wasn't looking forward to meeting her. Not at all. Don't be afraid. I'm going to make it clear that you are there for me and not to be their maid. Veronica is the daughter of a banker, and she is certain the world revolves around her, but truly, the world will revolve around you. He winked at her, and she laughed. What you've said about her makes me a little nervous, but at least I know you don't expect me to bend over backward trying to please her. That will make things a whole lot easier on me. She couldn't believe how much she was looking forward to leaving everything she knew and marrying the man standing beside her. She was glad she hadn't written to Elizabeth for a husband, because she had everything she needed right there. Asterisk. The storm broke around noon on Friday, and Charlie packed up all of her things. They decided to ride into Mistletoe on Saturday morning to get married and see if Annabelle was willing to take her place for a while. She wrote her letter to Elizabeth, explaining everything, but adding what wonderful employers Mary and Clyde had been and how she was sure whichever of her sisters went to help them would be welcomed with open arms. They would mail that while they were in town. Addie was sad to see Charlie go, and she hugged her often on Friday, knowing she only had another day with her. You'll like Annabelle, though. She's so nice, and she likes you a lot. Addie sighed. I know. 
I just don't want you to go. You're going to be at my wedding, though, aren't you? I need you there. We don't have flowers for you to carry, but I want you to watch me marry Abel. I'll be there, but I won't like it. The little girl ran off then, and her aunt came down the stairs with a grin. I made something for you. Not to sell. Mary held out a beautifully carved bride, and as Charlie looked closer at it, she realized that the bride was actually her. She had been immortalized in Mary's favorite wood. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you, Mary. I'll treasure it always. Mary grinned. I also have something else if you'd like to use it. I have the dress you and I made for my wedding on the way here. Remember how we sat on that train, taking turns sewing and taking care of the children? I would love you to wear that dress. Charlie smiled. I had no idea what I was going to wear to be married in, and that's perfect. I will be thrilled to wear your wedding dress. She reached out and hugged her friend. I am sorry to abandon you right now, though, she said when she pulled back, looking down at her friend's huge belly. I'll live. This was never meant to be a permanent arrangement, and we both knew that. I'm so happy you found the man that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Me too. Asterisk. Charlie spent a great deal more time than usual on her appearance while getting ready for her wedding on Saturday morning. The entire family piled into Clyde's wagon, and they drove into town, going to the pastor's house. The wedding went by much too quickly for Charlie, and when they'd said, I do, and the kiss was shared, she smiled up at the man she'd spent her life with. Abel. He would be hers forever. Charlie had been sure she'd be able to keep each moment of the day as if it was a photograph in her memory, but it all flitted by so quickly, she wasn't sure she would remember a thing. As soon as the wedding was over, Charlie and Mary went to talk to Annabelle and her parents, while the men waited in the wagon with the children. Annabelle came to the door, looking surprised to see them. Mrs. Bellman. Miss Miller. What can I help you with? Could we come in for a moment? Charlie asked. We have a proposition for you. Annabelle nodded, looking curious and lead the two ladies into the family's main area. It served as parlor, dining room, and kitchen. There was a small bedroom off the main room and a loft above, where Annabelle surely slept with her three younger sisters. As soon as they were seated, it was Charlie who began speaking. Now, we know you're marrying in a couple of months, so this is a short-term offer. I just married, and I'm moving away. Mary is going to need someone to help her until my younger sister arrives from back east. Would you be willing to move out to the Bellman Ranch and help out until she gets here? It should be less than two months. Annabelle looked startled by the offer, but a smile spread across her face. We're not planning to marry until June, so I have some time. Mary leaned forward then. The pay will be the same as we've been paying Charlie all this time. It includes room, board, and a wage. I know it would help you get started out on a better foot in your marriage. She named a wage, and Annabelle nodded eagerly. I need to let my parents know and write a note for John, but that will take just a few minutes. Will you wait? Charlie nodded emphatically. I'll feel a lot better about leaving today if I know you're there. I've already cleaned my room for you, and I changed the sheets. I'll have my own room? Annabelle asked. I've never had my own room. Mary smiled. Then you should take advantage of this offer and enjoy having your own room at least for a little while. Once you marry, you won't get to sleep alone again. John will be so excited that I'm making some money. Will it be a problem for me to go on Sunday rides with him? It's the only time all week we get to be together. I think that would be just fine, Mary said. I'll be right back. Annabelle hurried away to talk to her parents and write her note. She was obviously as excited about the job offer as they were to have her. I guess I'm not needed at all anymore, Charlie said with a frown. I thought I'd be harder to replace. 
Well, since you did all the work of finding your replacement, I think you did great. You are going to be sorely missed, Charlie Miller. I believe that's Charlie Burton now. Charlie and Abel accompany the family and their new helper home, helping her to get settled before they headed off to Missoula. Charlie was thankful that Abel had brought a wagon, because she wasn't sure how they would have gotten everything onto a horse. With a last hug for Mary and the children, Charlie climbed onto the wagon seat beside her new husband. It was so hard to leave, and she felt tears streaming down her face as Abel drove onto the road. At the last moment she knew she could see the house, Charlie turned and waved, cementing the look of the whole family out front waving at them into her mind as they drove away from Mistletoe, Montana. Chapter 4 They made it to Abel's home just before nightfall, and Charlie climbed down from the wagon, stiffer than she would have imagined she'd be. They'd used Mary's trick of baked potatoes at their feet, eating them as they drove to save time and keep them warm. She went into the house, while Abel was seeing to his horses. Charlie felt a little uncomfortable looking around the house. The house wasn't as grand as Elizabeth's was, but it was close. Charlie hadn't imagined how wealthy her new husband was, but now she could see that she was definitely marrying a man of means. Truly, she was glad she didn't know, because it was better that way. He would never worry that she had married him for his wealth. After Abel finished unhitching the horses, he walked into the house to find his new wife wandering around and looking at everything. There's really no food in the house, he told her, so we'll go to the diner tonight, and then we'll go to the mercantile on Monday. I can't imagine you cooking on your wedding night anyway. No woman should have to do that. Charlie laughed softly. I can't imagine not cooking on my wedding night. Don't spoil me and turn me into Veronica now. Abel laughed. You're too wonderful to ever be anything like Veronica. He cupped her face in his hands and kissed her. As much as I would like to do other things now, we need to get to the diner before they close if we want to eat tonight. Charlie nodded, resting her head on his shoulder for a moment. She too was eager for the wedding night, but she knew she needed to eat. Let's eat and then we'll do other things. He wrapped his arm around her shoulders and walked out of the house with her. They were in the middle of town, but she noted that even when he'd left for a few days, he hadn't bothered to lock the door. That pleased her. They'd been the same back in Beckham where she'd grown up. They walked a short way and turned a corner. He pointed out his shop. That's where I sell my art. The sign read, Abel's Art. I probably could have even guessed that, she said, tongue-in-cheek. Well, well, well. He shook his head. You've got an irrepressible tongue, there, don't you? Charlie laughed. What do you expect from one of the demon horde? He grinned at her. I still can't believe anyone called you that. You're so angelic. You just don't know me as well as you think you do yet. She took a deep breath as he stopped in front of the diner. She was a little worried about meeting his friends. Well, let's get in there. If the waitress acts like she knows me, I'm not sure why. We've never seen each other before. Charlie grinned, shaking her head. I have a feeling you know all the people who work here better than you care to admit. He opened the door for her, and they went inside, sitting at a small table in the corner. When the waitress came over, she smiled at him. Okay, we need a cup of coffee, and what do you drink, miss? What if I want something else to drink, he asked the waitress. Then someone is controlling you somehow. This is my wife, Charlie, he said softly. I have a feeling I won't be around as much, because she's an amazing cook. And she likes coffee, Charlie said, answering the woman's question. Two coffees. Are you going to have the special as well? The waitress asked. What's the special? Every Saturday we have a turkey, dressing, and mashed potato meal with fresh dinner rolls. That sounds delicious. I'll have that. Charlie knew he must really be there often if they knew what he would eat before he sat down. Coming up. 
The waitress hurried away, and Charlie looked at Abel. So I guess her knowing what you were going to drink and what you wanted to eat was a big surprise, huh? She's amazing at guessing what customers want. Ask anyone. A shadow fell over their table, and Charlie looked up to see a man who looked an awful lot like her new husband standing beside a very pregnant lady who was very close to her own age. You must be Kane and Veronica. Abel has told me so much about you both. I'm Charlotte, but most people just call me Charlie. Kane smiled. It's nice to meet you, Charlie. I haven't seen you around town before. That's because until a few hours ago, I lived in Mistletoe. Your brother went there to buy some art, and he married me and brought me back with him. Married? Veronica asked in a particularly shrill voice that was not pleasing to Charlie's ears. Yes. You know what marriage is, right? We stood up in front of a pastor in a church in my town, and he pronounced us man and wife, and then we kissed. Charlie's eyes met Abel's for a moment. I love Abel's kisses. Abel's hand covered hers on the table. We got married this morning. What are you two doing here? Veronica folded her hands on top of her belly. I wasn't feeling well enough to cook supper tonight. The baby weighs heavily on me. I'm not sure how I'm going to make it through the next two months. Charlie wasn't even certain what to say to that. Normally she'd volunteer to help out, but Abel had warned her about his sister-in-law, and she knew better. Maybe you should hire someone to help you out. Veronica frowned. Maybe we will. She seemed to look down her nose at Charlie, who simply smiled in return. After being a member of the demon horde for so long, Charlie certainly knew how to handle people looking down at her. Are you just getting here? Would you like to join us? Veronica immediately took the seat next to Abel. Yes, we would. She left the seat beside Charlie open for her husband, Kane. Abel, I thought you were only going to be gone for a few hours. We were planning to dine out with you on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as well. Abel shrugged. I got caught in a snowstorm and needed to take shelter. I'm sure the storm hit here as well. Weren't you worried about me? Not particularly. Unlike my husband, you know how to take care of yourself. Charlie immediately bristled, wanting to come to Kane's defense, but she had no idea how. She turned to the man beside her. I hope you had food to eat while you were indoors for so long. It must be hard for you having a wife with no desire to cook. Abel turned his laugh into a cough. Charlie already knew Veronica well. Thankfully, Kane is a good cook. We lived together before Kane married a year ago, and he usually fixed breakfast for us, because the diner isn't open until noon. A man who can cook? I've met very few of those over the years, Charlie said. I'm very impressed, Mr. Burton. Kane grinned at her. Please call me Kane. Tell me all about yourself, Charlie. Well, I come from back east, and my sister owns a mail-order bride agency there. When she decided to send out a friend of mine with two small children, I was hired to be her traveling companion to Mistletoe. I formed such a close bond with the woman and her niece and nephew that I stayed on to help, because she also ran a business from her home, and doing that and caring for two small children and a house was a lot. I enjoyed being with her and it was very pleasant for both of us. From across the table, Veronica sneered. And you couldn't find a husband out of all the single men that would be in a small town like Mistletoe? How sad. Oh, I had six proposals in my first week, but I was holding out for someone special. Her eyes met Abel's, and she smiled at him. I'm glad I waited, because I cannot imagine being married to any man other than Abel. Abel took her hand and brought it to his lips. May we always feel about one another the way we do today. Veronica scoffed. Within a month, you'll be done with each other. We were. Cain frowned at his wife. He obviously didn't like the way the woman talked about him or their marriage. That's enough, Veronica. 
Veronica got quiet, but she sulked through the meal. When the waitress brought four specials, they all picked up their forks. This looks delicious, Charlie said to the waitress. I can't wait to start eating. Don't wait, then, the waitress said with a laugh. I made the dinner rolls, so you have to compliment me on them later. You can be sure I will. Charlie loved to be complimented on her cooking and baking, and she assumed everyone else felt the same. Throughout the meal, Charlie tried to ignore Veronica's gaze. It was obvious the other woman didn't like her, but she wasn't sure why. She had done nothing that would offend the other girl. Not that she knew of anyway. As they ate, Charlie felt Veronica giving her strange looks. Charlie couldn't help but notice that it was Abel paying the bill. She wondered why, but didn't feel comfortable asking, even though they were married. When the meal was finally over, Charlie could think of nothing she wanted more than sleep. It had been a very long day, and she was ready for it to be over. She felt uncomfortable around Veronica, but she would never admit it. Abel held her hand as they were leaving the diner, Veronica, and came behind them. The four of them walked together down the street, toward the house where she would be living with Abel. So what hours is the store open? Charlie finally asked, trying to break the silence. She felt like she and Kane would get along well, but Veronica was another story entirely. She was the kind of girl that she had once happily thrown eggs at when the girl got too close to the Miller farm. Charlie wished she had some eggs right then, but she wasn't sure of how her new husband would react. I usually open from 10 to 3. That's enough hours for me to make good sales, and then I spend the rest of my time reading and trying to procure more art for the shop. Veronica made a noise of disgust from behind them. Sure, you'll shorten your hours for your new wife, but when you were courting me, you ignored me most of the time. Charlie kept smiling, but she felt like she was going to break. He'd courted that, that, snobbish idiot? There was no way he could have. I guess it's a good thing he married the woman he wanted to spend time with, isn't it? They had reached their house, and Charlie turned to the other couple. It was so nice meeting you, Kane. I'm looking forward to getting to know my new brother. Kane smiled. I'm looking forward to getting to know you, too. I'd love to learn some tips from you. Tips? Charlie asked. Tips for standing up for myself, Kane said, winking at her. Charlie laughed. Good night, Veronica. Charlie. Veronica said nothing else as she turned her back and waited on the other side of the street for her husband. Kane shook his head. I'm sorry she made things more difficult for you. Charlie shrugged. I've known a lot of girls like her. I've thrown a lot of eggs and rotten apples at girls like her, too. If all else fails, I'll start collecting eggs. Abel covered his mouth with his hand to hide his laughter. My wife was once known as a member of the Demon Horde of Massachusetts. Veronica is never going to be able to ruffle this one's feathers. Truly, that was one of the things he was looking for when he wanted a wife. Not a member of the Demon Horde, of course, because he'd never heard of such a thing. No, he'd been looking for a woman who wouldn't be upset by Veronica's theatrics. I'm so glad. I wouldn't want her to upset you. Kane smiled. I'd invite the two of you over for supper, but Veronica will find some reason she can't cook, and we'll end up having to go to the diner anyway. Why don't the two of you dine with us on Wednesday evening, then? I'll cook. I enjoy it, and maybe some of my happiness will rub off on your miserable wife. As soon as she said the words, she felt as if she'd gone too far. Charlie covered her mouth with one hand. Sorry. No, you're just speaking the truth. We'd love to come for supper on Wednesday. Six? Sounds great. Charlie beamed at her new brother-in-law. I really am glad to have met you. Kane leaned down and kissed Charlie's cheek, before turning and joining his wife on the street. Now don't you start falling for my brother, Abel said. I'm not sure I can stand to lose two ladies to him. 
Did you lose her to him? Charlie asked, frowning up at Abel. When I wouldn't marry her after knowing her for two weeks, she ran off and married my brother. He shrugged. I'm just glad that she's out of my hair. Charlie reached up and ruffled Abel's hair, playfully. Nope. No shrew in there. Abel laughed. I've never heard a word that fit her better. You might want to take your use of it up with Shakespeare, though. He might not like it being used that way. Charlie grinned. I've only seen a little bit of your home. Perhaps you should show me where I'll sleep. He grinned at her, spotting her carpet bag on the floor and grabbing it and then taking her hand. He led her up the stairs, thinking about the night they were about to share. Their first time together, and all he could feel was excitement. Shouldn't he be at least a little nervous? He led her into the large, spacious room at the top of the stairs. This is my room. I don't know if you like the colors, but you can do whatever you want with it. She smiled, walking to him and wrapping her arms around his neck, pulling his head down for a kiss. I have a feeling I'm not even going to notice what the room looks like for a very long while. He laughed softly. If you do notice, it will be due to a lack of trying on my part. He moved his hands to the buttons on the back of her dress and he slowly liberated each button from its hole. When he was finished, he moved his hands to touch the soft skin of her back. Charlie stepped away from him and let the dress fall to the floor, before moving back into his arms. She was surprised she'd been brazen enough to undress in front of him, but she couldn't just stand back and let him look at her. Even covered by her petticoat didn't feel like it was enough. Within minutes, they were both naked on the bed together, and he was kissing down the side of her neck toward her breast. When he reached her breast, he sucked the nipple into his mouth, causing her to let out a gasp of surprise. She threaded her fingers through his hair, and then moved them down, caressing his neck and all the way down his back to his bottom. He groaned. Maybe you shouldn't do that just yet. I want to take my time with you and you're making that very difficult. Charlie sighed. I don't care. I want to touch you. Do so, at your own risk. He lowered his head to hers and kissed her more deeply as his hands roamed over her body, one going to the secret spot between her thighs. Much later, they lay together on the bed, her head pillowed on his shoulder, both of them breathing heavily. That was nice, she said softly. He chuckled. Nice? What an inadequate word for what we just shared. Next time I want to hear earth-shattering or spectacular. No more of this nice stuff. She grinned, kissing his shoulder. I'll do my best to remember. I don't mean to offend you at all. Well, you did. Smiling at her, he sighed. We need to be up early, though probably not as early as you had to get up on the ranch. Doesn't matter. I can go on just a little sleep. She sighed. I never dreamed being married would be so wonderful. Will I always feel like I do right now? I sure hope so. Chapter 5 At church the following morning, Abel introduced Charlie to everyone in the congregation. After the service, Veronica and Kane joined them. Are you buying us lunch? Veronica asked. A flash of annoyance crossed Abel's face, before he said, of course. Charlie couldn't help but wonder what that was about. She knew he'd paid for the other couple's meal the night before, but he didn't always pay for their meals, did he? The four of them gathered their coats from the coat room at the back of the church, before they walked the short distance to the diner. Once they were seated, the waitress came over with three drinks. It was a different waitress than the night before, but they obviously ate there often. What would you like to drink, miss? she asked Charlie. Coffee is fine. Abel smiled at the waitress, a woman old enough to be his mother. Marie, this is my wife, Charlie. She'll be joining me when I come from now on. But I do plan to make him eat at home more, Charlie said with a smile. Well. 
I didn't think either of you boys would marry someone who could cook. That's just crazy. Murray smiled at them all. It's good to meet you, Charlie. Thank you. So what can I get everyone to eat? Special on Sunday is pot roast with mashed potatoes, carrots, and a beef gravy. Comes with biscuits. Charlie shrugged. Special sounds good to me. So four specials. I'll be right back. You three eat out way too often if the waitress can take one look at you and know what you want. Charlie sighed. I'm going to be cooking for all four of us, huh? Veronica narrowed her eyes. Well, I certainly can't cook. I was raised with servants. I thought that I'd have servants after I married, and then I find out Kane isn't wealthy after our wedding. She shook her head. How else am I going to eat? I'm eating for two, you know. I'll teach you to cook if you'd like. The words were out of Charlie's mouth before she realized what she was saying. I have no desire to learn to cook. I expect it to be done for me. Abel frowned and looked at Veronica. You won't take advantage of my wife. If you want to learn to cook, that's just fine. If you don't want to learn, you may have to find a way to get a servant or two. Charlie will not be your servant or your chef. Veronica frowned at him, but she took a drink of her coffee to mask it. What do you expect us to do, then? I expect you to figure out how to cook. It's not my wife's job to keep you fed. I've let you two eat with me, and I've paid for it for the past year. No more. If you want free meals, you're going to have to figure out how to be really nice to my wife so she'll invite you. Abel smiled when Marie came back with their food. Thank you, Marie. You're very welcome. Marie hurried off back toward the kitchen, and Charlie took a bite of her beef. This is good. She could make better, but it really was good. Not as good as your stew. Or your chicken and dumplings. Or your cake or cobbler. Charlie laughed. Don't name everything I've ever cooked for you now. It would take too long. I wasn't planning on it. He reached out and took her hand in his, and Charlie could see a cloud roll over Veronica's face. She didn't like affection between Abel and Charlie, even though she'd married his brother. Odd. After the meal, they all walked together toward Abel's house. Charlie couldn't think of it as hers yet. When they went into the house, she was surprised when Veronica and Kane followed. Are you visiting this afternoon? We usually stay until after supper on Sundays. It's not good for me to walk so far out of town and then have to walk back in again. Charlie frowned. She'd been looking forward to a long leisurely day with Abel. Her mother had always said the more she walked during her pregnancies the easier the labor was, so she was sure that Veronica was full of bull manure. So you'll be going to supper with us, I take it? We will. Kane frowned at his wife. I should start making our meals, but she complains about them, because I can only make breakfast foods. Would you like me to teach you to cook? she asked Kane. I'm sure Veronica would trade places with you and manage the ranch. Veronica glared at her and went to the parlor, sitting down and folding her arms across her chest. She said nothing, but her looks were trying hard to kill Charlie. Kane grinned at Charlie. I think that's a great idea. I'll learn to cook and clean, and she can manage the cattle. One of us has to do each thing. That would work for me. Charlie went into the kitchen and searched for any traces of food. She looked in the icebox and the pantry, but she found nothing she could cook. I'm going to have to spend most of the day tomorrow shopping, so I can start cooking here. I've never seen a house quite so devoid of food. I could make some coffee, but that looks like all I could muster up. Abel smiled and shook his head. I don't care for any coffee right now. Join us in the parlor, and maybe we can play a game of some sort. I have a deck of cards. Charlie shrugged, following them into the parlor, but feeling like a wastrel. 
It was rare that she didn't have things to do. Kane and Veronica had taken chairs, so Abel sat down on the sofa with Charlie sitting close to him. He put his arm around her shoulders, wishing they were alone. What are your plans for tomorrow? he asked Charlie. Shopping needs to be first on my list. I've never seen a house so devoid of any food. She shook her head at Abel. I don't know how you've survived this way. It's easy if you don't cook for yourself and eat out for every meal. Abel stroked her hand with his. Well, you won't be eating out for every meal again. What did you eat for breakfast? He shrugged. I mostly just skipped it. Well, you won't be from now on. I need you to tell me your favorite foods so I can make sure to cook them. All Charlie could think about was being a good wife and making sure her husband was happy. Trying to make me look bad? Veronica asked, obviously annoyed. I forgot you were even there. I was trying to keep my husband happy. My mother always told us that our most important duty as wives would be keeping our men happy. Happy means, content with food and how I keep the house, so that starts tomorrow. Veronica frowned. Are you not planning to eat out tomorrow night? I am going to cook for my husband. Why wouldn't I? I have a beautiful kitchen that's equipped with all the modern conveniences. It would be a shame if I didn't cook. Well, plan on cooking for four, then. We're going to need something to eat as well. Charlie looked at her husband and waited for him to say something, but when he didn't, she nodded. I'll cook for four, then. I hope you're as good of a cook as your husband makes it sound like you are. I refuse to eat inferior food. Wanting so badly to say something terribly ugly to the other girl, Charlie chose instead to keep quiet. There was no way she could say anything at that moment without it sounding sarcastic or downright mean. Kane leaned forward, facing his wife. If she's cooking a meal for us, I don't care if it's the most disgusting thing you've ever put in your mouth. You'll pretend you like it and act grateful. I swear I think you were raised by wolves sometimes. Well, I wasn't, and I happen to know my manners are impeccable. Why would you say something so horrible to me? Veronica got up and ran from the room, sobbing. Charlie waited for a minute, and when neither man stood up to go after the pregnant psychopath, she stood up to follow her. Where are you going? Kane asked, looking at her with shock. She's upset, and I know how easily pregnant women get their feelings hurt. I'm going to go after her and make sure she's all right. You can't. Abel grabbed her wrist to stop her. Why not? Because that's what she wants, Kane explained. If you go after her now, you'll go after her for the rest of your life. Our lives are intertwined because my brother and I are close and there's no way you'll get away from her. Ever. That's terrible. Charlie said. How can you think that about your wife? Kane sighed. Give it thirty seconds, and you'll hear her sobs grow in volume. She's trying to get someone to follow her and do what she wants. Charlie stood quietly for a moment, and then, as predicted, Veronica's cries raised in volume. Her cries were loud, theatric, and ridiculous sounding. There was no way they were real. She looked between the two men, her eyes wide. I take it this has happened once or twice? Or a hundred times? Abel sighed. She's ridiculous, and we're not chasing her down. And neither are you. Charlie sat back down on the sofa. So let's talk some more about what you men enjoy eating. I love to cook, and I'll happily make just about anything you want. The two men exchanged a glance. I love pork chops, Kane said. If you'll make pork chops just once, and maybe show me how to make them, I will love you forever. Abel looked at his brother. Careful what you're saying to my wife. You already stole one spoiled rotten woman from me. Kane sighed. And how I wish I hadn't. Focus, boys. I need to know what you like to eat. Kane frowned at her. I love everything. 
Seriously. Fresh bread is amazing to me. I'm even excited to have a bacon sandwich. Someone cooking a real meal makes me very happy. All right. Abel? I loved everything you made in mistletoe. You seemed to just come up with something, and there was nothing that wasn't exceptional. Just cook, and I'll be happy. I promise. She frowned for a moment. If you ever want something that just sounds good to you, you'll let me know, though, right? I need to keep you happy. He laughed. You already make me so happy, it's ridiculous. Thank you. She sighed resting her head on his shoulder. It's not supposed to be this easy to make my husband happy. My mother always said it was the most difficult task of womanhood. Abel kissed her forehead. I'm easy to please. Veronica stormed back into the room and flopped down onto the overstuffed chair she'd been sitting in. Her face didn't look like she'd been crying at all. What time will you want us to come by for supper every night? Every night. This woman expected her to cook for her and her husband every night. What is wrong with you? Charlie thought about it for a moment. Why don't we plan to eat at six, but you could come over at four every afternoon for cooking lessons? I will teach you for exactly one month, and then I expect you to cook for yourself. One month? But that's when my baby is due. Veronica leaned forward, her eyes narrowed. Are you telling me that you think I should cook as soon as the baby is born? Charlotte closed her eyes for a moment and imagined ripping out fistfuls of the other girl's hair. When she opened them, she smiled. I'm sure I could be persuaded to help you after the baby is born. For a short while. Abel frowned. You won't be taking advantage of my wife, though. She's a good woman, and she doesn't deserve to be treated as your servant. Why would you think I'd do something like that? Veronica asked, her voice starting to go very high-pitched, which was already a warning sign for Charlie. Probably because you're used to having servants, Charlie said softly. I'm sure you don't mean to treat people around you like they are beneath you, but it's part of your upbringing. Veronica folded her arms across her chest. I'm glad someone understands me. Perhaps we can be friends after all. Charlie didn't respond, not wanting to spend more time with her new sister-in-law than absolutely necessary. Sure was putting it nicely. When they left for supper that night, the four of them once again walked together through the streets of Missoula. It was obvious Veronica only stayed so that Abel would pay for her supper, and Abel seemed willing. Charlie couldn't imagine how he'd gotten into the habit of paying for meals for his brother and sister-in-law but she didn't think it was a good thing for any of them. After supper was over and the other couple had said their goodnights, Charlie sighed with relief. How did you end up paying for every meal they eat? Charlie asked softly. She didn't want to sound accusing, but she couldn't imagine how that had even come about. I have no idea, honestly. When they were first married a year ago, Veronica would insist Cain take her for supper and they always timed it while I was there. The check would be handed to me, and I just paid it. It never occurred to me I was setting a bad pattern. He ran his fingers through his hair. Now, they don't seem to eat unless I'm there to pay. I'm the oldest, so I did get a bigger inheritance than Cain, but he should be able to pay for their food. Charlie shook her head. My matchmaker sister, Elizabeth, lives in a grand mansion in Beckham, Massachusetts. It's only about three miles from where we grew up. My parents have never once asked her for a dime, and they've always had financial problems. I'm not sure why your brother is taking advantage of you. If Cain had his preferences, he wouldn't be coming into town to eat every meal. Trust me. He truly thought when he married Veronica that she would be a typical wife and take care of the house and the food. It's never worked that way between them. I don't even want to imagine the filth they must be living in. I haven't been to his ranch since he married. I've never been invited. Perhaps you should go and spend a day there, helping her learn to be a wife. Charlie frowned. 
I don't think it would do any good. She's going to use being pregnant to keep from having to do anything at all. And then she's going to insist the baby is too little for her to be away from it. Or she's recovering from childbirth. I know her type, unfortunately. Well, I'm glad you're not the same kind of person she is. I don't think I could even bear to look at you. Charlie laughed. I'm nothing like her at all. I promise. I would say we should send away for one of my sisters to help her out the way we did for Mary, but I don't think she would be willing to pay. And I'm not willing to subject one of my sisters to her. I wouldn't even send for a member of the demon horde at this moment. He smiled, taking her hand and leading her toward the stairs. I'm guessing there's nothing you feel the need to do before bed tonight. I do want to make a quick list for the store tomorrow. You have nothing, so I need to be more careful about shopping. She paused and looked at him. Do you have an account at the store I can just add things to? Or do you want to give me household money? For tomorrow, I can just use some of the money I earned helping Mary, but for the future, how do you want me to handle things? Just put it all on my account at the store. You don't ever need to use money you've earned for our household. Ever. All right. May I use your office to make my list? And then I'll be right up. She didn't plan to spend more than 30 minutes or so working on her list, though it would need to be the most comprehensive shopping list in the entire history of shopping lists. Abel nodded. He wanted to be with her, but just like he had a job, so did she. Use my office. There's paper and a pencil on the desk. Thank you. She stood on tiptoe and kissed his cheek. I'll hurry. That's a good thing, because I really don't want to have to wait. Charlie sat down and made out a menu, and then she listed everything she would need on the list. She had to remember to add staples like flour and sugar that most homes would already have. When she finished, she sighed and pushed away from the desk. She had no idea what Veronica planned to do when the baby was born, because she didn't seem to have any idea how to take care of herself. How could she take care of an infant who relied on her for everything? Walking up the stairs, Charlie carried the list to put on the bureau upstairs. She had to stop worrying about the other couple. Though she had no idea how, 